All right, so um, first of all, I'm going to talk about this. This is the Kohlberg ball, and this is an example of a type of talking stick. And Native Americans, they used to use a talking stick to um, say when it was okay for each person to talk and when it was not, so it would ease conflicts. So we're gonna use this and pass it off to each other when it's our turn to speak. And if anyone else has a question, we ask that you respect the ball and wait until it is passed to you to speak. All right. And we promise not to check it hard at anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so they can raise their hand and you'll toss it to them? Is that what you're saying? Yep. I, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're doing our, our uh, lesson about Lawrence Colbert. Uh, the Heinz Dilemma was kind of the foundational bit of research that he did, and from it, um, his theories developed into a, a six-stage uh, concept. Um, they're right here, uh, divided into three levels, six stages, and stage one. Stage one, it's um, obedience and punishment oriented. oriented. So let's say a child is caught with their hand in the cookie jar. They're not um, afraid of getting possibly sick from the cookie. They're more afraid of being caught. So that's level one, and that's considered pre-conventional morality. Uh, stage two is more individualism and exchange. That's where the individual begins to understand that there are differences of opinion and uh, it's the at that point they start to form a trader exchange kind of mentality uh, the one of the explanations that one child had was what the druggist had coming to them uh, was the for Heinz to steal the the drugs because uh, he wasn't making a fair deal with Heinz so he had it coming to him um, it, at this point, uh, people that are at the stage tend to speak as an individual and not as a society. Okay? Okay, so um, we're getting into level two, which, which is conventional now. And uh, stage three is interpersonal accord and conformity. So this happens most often during the adolescent years. And it's when people conform to rules and have a moral code based on whether or not they are being good or bad. So it's kind of like the good girl, bad boy mentality, and it's kind of like um, stereotype rules. So that's, now we're out of the uh, pre-conventional, we're into the conventional stages. Stage three has been called the uh, ends justify the means as well. And stage four is when the when the individual comes out of the ends justify the mean, they begin to see things in a grand social order sort of, they, they just start to see things as uh, the greater good at that point. The greater good being social constraint and uh, what would happen if, if, if the ends did justify the means, what would happen if everybody, because they were gonna be late to work, the traffic signals just don't matter. I'm gonna go ahead and run them. What would happen in know in the world if that was the mindset at stage four they start to realize that right so we're out of stage uh, the level conventional level and we're on to stage five so level three is post-conventional and we're on stage five so stage five is social contract basically I think it's for um, it's utilitarianism versus uh, individualism. So it's where um, we do things for the greater good. So um, even though we might do something that may be bad for one person, if it can help 100 people, then it's OK. And it's probably something we should be doing. Stage six was uh, is kind of the, is considered the universal principle. Uh, the concepts that Kohlberg uh, really tried to embrace in this one or tried to state, overstate, were 
those embraced by Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., they were very, very high-reaching uh, moral, you know, moral decisions. Um, and this, I guess the underlying theme for stage six would be equal respect for all, uh, regardless of their place or position. Um, he actually decided to drop this stage in 1983 and uh, made it a theoretical stage at that point. So it's not, uh, depending on which reports you read and which papers, they may still, they may only list five, and then this one will be kind of a footnote, stage six, because it is so rarely attained, I guess, uh, actually. Okay. Oh, at, and at stage six also, that would be the ideal for social and civil disobedience um, in light of justice. And I kind of thought in light of the, what they're calling the Middle Eastern Spring, uh, the way that the, that was initiated in Egypt might be a good, a fair representation of some people with stage six mindsets of, you know, endangering themselves for the good of others and yeah, culture in general. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, actually, do you guys, does anybody want to share what they wrote down for their Heinz dilemma before we uh, move on past the six stages? I know we're trying to speed it along a little bit. Um, I gave the same question to my GED students, and we did it as a class. So we um, went in and we stole the, and these are all my very honest Hispanic people, we stole the drug, but then we wrote an IOU. And then we said we'd pay them back when we could. So we, we did. Probably left the computer, but. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, the, uh, through doing all this research, uh, the one thing that I personally found most interesting about him was his life. I really, uh, the stages I like, but I'm not a psychologist, and it's not, I'm more into the person. And what an incredibly fascinating guy, honestly. He, uh, he was really into literature at a very early age, very well, you know, well read and everything. He acquired so much information that uh, he only had to, when he tested in for University of Chicago, he only had to go for one year to get his bachelor's degree and because he tested so high. He, uh, before he went into university, he signed on as a merchant marine, shuttling refugees from all over Europe, uh, working as a second engineer on a transport, on a freighter, bringing people to the British-occupied Palestine. Uh, at one point, he was captured on the island of Cyprus by, uh, as part of the blockade that they had going, was busted out of jail by some gr uh, Israeli guerrillas, basically, busting him out. I mean, what, what a fascinating guy. And this is all before he went into academia. Uh, just a cool guy. Um, he uh, ended up being recruited at, uh, at Harvard, and based on some of the other presentations. We know who he spent time with. Uh, spent some time with Piaget as well, studying that uh, really heavily, and that's where a lot of the, a lot of his philosophies came from um, initially. And I think that's pretty obvious. Um, he did open up later on in his career who he tried uh, his research on, and at that point he started going. That's what I'm guessing that Gilligan based her her premise that he was influenced heavily by the upper upper income men because at that point I think he may have it started off with lower income and middle in, uh, middle class and lower income kids in Chicago is what he had started his initial research on traveled to Israel uh, spent quite a bit of time over there and, and do you pronounce it kibbutz mm -hmm. is that the the farms that he worked on spent a lot of time in those I thought that was really just what a, what a guy that loved life and loved helping people, loved learning about what motivated people to help others. And this is very, very fascinating. He, you can see he did contract a uh, tropical disease. It was a parasite. And did you find any 
We did some research, thank you, and we couldn't find, Al, what was the exact tropical disease that uh, caused him to perish in a way, and we'll get to more of that later, but um, we were guessing that maybe it was dengue fever, but we're not sure because we're not um, physicians. But. Yeah. Checked all of the, uh, all the information about him. Nothing says what he, what he suffered from for 20 years. He did, or uh, what, 16 years. I did read the obituary that Lana forwarded to me from the New York Times, and uh, to drown yourself, I cannot imagine a worse way to commit suicide personally uh, than putting rocks in your the pockets of the jacket that you're wearing and waiting out. That's what some, some of the opinions of how he died were. They weren't able to substantiate a whole lot. They did see, some people did see him go in the water. That's his as much information as they have, but for a guy who loved people and loved helping people and seeing how people helped others and what motivated them to do that, to die like that seemed really kind of, uh, just really sad. Yes, that's what I also found most interesting about Kohlberg. So that's what motivated me to write a poem about Kohlberg's last thoughts mm -hmm. and how this, this brilliant, mind would would choose uh, to take his own life and what what pro like what prompted it prompted him and uh, how did that fit in with his moral development thanks do you want to read the poem now um, yeah let uh, so if each of you wouldn't mind uh, turning to your neighbor and saying one interesting fact that you've learned from either the stages or his biography just really quickly just Mention to your neighbor.